um, to this online event. Uh, that's the presentation and an expert debate on the recently launched uh, Heinrich Böll and Friends of the Earth Insect Atlas 2020. Um, my name is Lisa. I'm from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, I am speaking to you from Germany today, but I am usually based in Brussels, um, where I work for the EU office um, of the foundation. And the Heinrich Böll Foundation is the German Green Political Foundation that is affiliated with the Green Party that is represented in Germany's federal parliament. And I'm the head of the International Climate, Energy and Agriculture Policy Program. And as such, I have worked on different issues around the European Green Deal, among other things, um, the biodiversity strategy and the farm fork strategy that we're going to touch upon later um, in this webinar. Before we start with the content, let me briefly explain some technical uh, details. I think you're all uh, not new to Zoom by now. Um, so please be aware um, of the chat function. You can um, shoot us uh, messages to either uh, the panelists or all attendees. And you can also use that to exchange, share links um, on anything that you have expertise on. And we also have the questions and answers section. This is to be used for um, questions that you would like to address to our panelists. And you can also use that to like other people's questions so that they appear further up. And I will take that into account when I forward the questions to our um, panelists later. Um, and be aware of the fact that this webinar is being recorded. Um, so you can forward that to your colleagues that were unable to join. Um, yes, so that was the, the technical details. Let's uh, start right off with uh, the content. And um, in order to get an idea of um, who you are and who is listening, I ask you to um, answer a little poll and also to wake you up and get you a little active. Um, and this is a polling um, in order to uh, yeah, know which sector you are from. Are you rather from civil society? Are you from academia? Are you from business, politics, or other? Just to get an idea of our fellow um, attendees. So I see that we have quite a lot of people from joining from the civil society, quite a few others. Half of you voted. Okay, that only gives us um, a rather good idea. Quite a lot of um, representatives from the civil society, NGOs, foundations, etc. Okay, great. You can also see that, right? So, great. Um, and then I have another question for you. Um, the second question. Oops. Is that working? No. Polling, polling too. Now you should be able to see it. Sorry, some, some technical issues here. Um, and this is an um, a question to make you estimate how many insects there are per person alive today. So if we were to count them, how many insects um, are there per capita on Earth? Do you think there are 1,400 per person, 1.4 billion, or one, sorry, 1.4 million, or 1.4 billion? What do you think? Some of you are hesitant. A winner seems to be appearing, 1.4 million, but let's see, only, only two thirds have voted. Okay, we, we seem to have a winner. Most of you chose the middle, but fun fact, it's actually 1.4 billion. And I think that's a very uh, fascinating um, and just mind blowing fun fact. Um, uh, there are so many insects from over 5.5 million species as well. And that was also a test um, for you, whether you have already started to read our insect atlas that has been la launched very recently, because um, that fun fact is actually one of the first um, sentences that appears in the atlas, um, which is going to be the center of our debate today. So um, insects keep the plant's ecological uh, system running and ensure our food supply. They improve soil quality, reduce plant pests, but they are, as we all know, under massive threats. And in this online event, we will explore the most important reasons for the European and global decline of insects in numbers and diversity. And we will talk about how the EU can support climate and insect-friendly uh, methods of farming. 
We will, um, as it is very topical, focus on the EU biodiversity strategy that was um, published just uh, over a month ago, as well as the, as the EU farm to fork strategy. And we will also touch upon the common agricultural policy, um, which obviously plays a big role in this regard. The agenda of this event is the following. We will first have a presentation, a very short presentation um, about the insect atlas itself, uh, some, some key messages, um, some, some takeaways. And then we have a keynote uh, speech by um, Umberto Delgado Rosa from the European Commission. And then we will have um, comments from civil society, the European Parliament and um, academia on the insect atlas and the biodiversity and farm to fork strategy. And at the end, we have um, a panel where um, you can also um, ask your questions. So I, I invite you to, whenever you have a question, already um, write it in the questions and answers section. So without further ado, I now give the floor to Dr. Christine Chemnitz. She is the head of International Agriculture Policy Division at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung in Berlin. And as such, she has already worked on uh, different atlases, such as the Meat Atlas and Agriculture Atlas. And now she's going to present the first uh, Insect Atlas. Um, and Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lisa. I will share my screen. Give me a short sign if you can see everything. Perfect. So thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the Insect Atlas to all of you. Um, so let me first start with what is actually the Insect Atlas and why did we publish it? The Atlas compiles scientific available knowledge, and I would say it translates it to, from, from scientific language to understandable language. So we do that because the Heinrich Böll Foundation, we believe that agriculture and agricultural policy concerns not only farmers and experts, but actually all parts of the society. So we believe that if we want a better agricultural policy, we need a broad and lively public debate about our agricultural system and how it connects to our environment. Since these topics are sometimes complex and hard to understand, um, we aim to explain them in an understandable way. And this is actually what we do with the atlases. So what did I do? I picked actually five facts from the many facts the atlas presents, and I will elaborate a little bit on these aspects. So let me start with the very first one. And this is nothing less than that we face a severe and worldwide decline in abundance and diversity of insects. But before we come to that, um, I present you a map. And this map presents actually what Lisa already touched upon in her poll, that we have a tremendous and actually unbelievable diversity of insects on Earth. And these yellow bubbles actually show the numbers of species in the different regions and scientists assume that we have something between 5.5 million and 10 million different species living on earth and up to now about 1.8 million species are discovered and classified and they live actually on nearly every ecosystem of the world. So it might be that this seemingly in, infinite number is the reason which leads to the fact that we as a society have missed for so long the protection of insects so bad. The public debate actually here in Germany at least started a few years ago when a study was published which showed that the overall flying insects in Germany in certain regions have decreased within the last 30 years by more than 75% overall. So an outscream somehow went through the public. And just slightly later, uh, the University of Sydney published a study, a meta study, which so showed that more than 30% or more than 40% of all insect species, the population declines. And scientists assume that more than 30% of all species are actually endangered. However, there was some critique on both studies. And um, the most critique actually was that there was not enough evidence from especially the global south. So actually, 
we don't have a very clear global number, like this one number we would like to have, which shows a definite decline. But however, even though there are certain uncertainties, we know far enough to act and we know we have a severe problem. For Europe, the numbers are clearer. The decrease in wild bees and hoover flies have been clearly documented. At least one out of 10 bees and butterfly species is threatened with extinction. And of the 2,000 wild bees in Europe, more than 9% are thought to be threatened with extinction, according to the European Red List. The most difficult thing you actually can see on this little map uh, here on, this, on my screen to the lower left side is that most of the studies which are available actually come from either the EU or the US. And we tremendously lack scientific knowledge from the global south and from those countries where we have the most agriculture, the strongest agriculture expansion and intensification of agriculture actually. So for example, take Brazil or um, Asia or as well the African countries, you can see we tremendously lack scientific knowledge here that more than three quarters of all studies which look at the decrease of insects um, see agriculture as the most important reason for insect decline. Three sub aspects I would like to highlight is one is the monotony of the agricultural landscape, which is insects just miss fodder plants and places to hide and live. The second is pesticides and the third is the increase of animals kept in intensive production systems and stables uh, um, and instead of raising them on pasture. So what has the use of pesticides to do with the decrease of insects? Pesticides are worldwide still tremendously on the rise. You can see that on this graph, actually on the smaller uh, lower right part uh, in, in the graph here. Um, worldwide use of pesticides has increased 50 times since 1950. And since 1990 alone, the use has almost doubled. In 2018, global sales amounted to 56 billion euros. And industry forecasters assume that up to 2023, the market will increase to 82 billion euros. So the market for pesticides is growing, even though it is known that they are a threat to insects and it's most strongly growing actually in Asia, more precisely in China, but as well in South America, which is one of the most promising markets uh, of the future. And um, the EU curve is rather flat actually. Some EU countries increase their use of pesticides, others markets are saturated. So, but overall the market is really relatively stable. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't decrease. So you might think, oh great, then like this global thing has nothing to do with us, but unfortunately you are wrong because the EU is, and actually Germany in the front line, is among the most important pesticide exporters on the globe. Um, what you can see here in the graph is that um, the share of highly hazardous pesticides used as part of the total use is much higher in Kenya and Brazil than it is, for example, in the Netherlands. And, um, and a study from Kenya examined that these pesticides, not only the, uh, the, the highly hazardous one, but all pesticides are mainly coming from Europe and China. So the EU is the second largest exporter of pesticides to Kenya. And so our policies and our regions and our economy has a lot to do with the decrease of insects in other regions of the world as well. So we have to get our policies right here. And um, I'm happy that we talk about this today. And that brings me actually to my second point, which is 
our industrial meat production is a major driver of global insect decline as well. Um, so the global hunger for cheap meat is triggering actually a chain reaction of deforestation, monocultures and pesticide use. You might remember my very first slide actually with the yellow bubbles and you might remember the huge bubble on South America. Now to put it simple, we are currently sacrificing actually land in Brazil and other uh, South American countries. So the most biodiverse countries in the world to produce soy, to get cheap meat for our industrial meat production. Of the almost 2 million classified insect species worldwide, Brazil is home of 9%. Yeah. And at the same time, Brazil is now, since 2018, the major exporter and producer of soybeans. And it produces soybeans on more than 36 million hectares. Just to compare that again to my home country, Germany, Germany's size is only about um, 35 million hectares. So imagine just in Brazil, we produce soy on an area which is larger than the full area of Germany. Brazil is one of the main, here you see actually on this graph as well, the steady rise of production in Brazil. And it's not only the production, but it's as well that Brazil is the main importer of herbicides globally. And just a little fact on, on the side is that the Mercosur agreement as well incorporates a, a section on chemicals and taxes on pesticides for imports uh, are part of tax cuts on pesticides are part of the EU Mercosur trade deal as well. So this whole production model is even going to get stronger. Let me come to my very last slide and maybe this gives us a little hope as well. And this is actually that we have enough research which shows us we could do better. So organic ag agriculture can protect insects much better than conventional agriculture. We have a meta study from 2018 uh, from Germany, which shows actually that there are more butterflies, more bees, more wildflowers on the field, but as well on beside the fields as soon as it is under organic production. So actually we know what to do. The Insect Atlas shows that again. These are only, have only been some very few graphs from the more than uh, 19 sections and more than 50 graphs of the Insect Atlas. We know what to do. We just need to do the right things. And I hope you like the graphs I showed you and the facts I presented. If you are interested, you can visit as well our webpage. Um, if you read German, uh, if you if you read English, you will find the Insect Atlas there. If you understand German, we do have a film and a podcast as, as well to provide you with more information. And um, one important fact is as well that the Insect Atlas is published under Creative Commons license and that it is really meant to be shared and meant to be used. So you can download all the graphs you're interested in on our webpage as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tina, for that very nice overview. And I really invite you to check out the web dossier as well, where you can find all these graphs and obviously the Insect Atlas as PDF as well as that. He is um, the, the director of the Natural Capital Unit in DG Environment of the European Commission and is now going to talk about the highly topical um, biodiversity Which, strategy and yeah, spricht jetzt über die biodiversity. on May 20th. So please, Umberto, the floor is yours. Thank you for oh, staying a little longer. Thank you very much. My first word is to congratulate the Heinrich Boll Foundation. So my first point is, of course, here Ihnen meine Glückwünsche. And also allowing me to share some thoughts with you. And I apologize that I must leave right after my talk, but I leave a colleague, Vujadin Kovacevic. Uh, to reply. So the first thing, it's pretty obvious that... Oh, and it's doch ziemlich klar. Insects, 
that we that's a default in the EU, where we where it's uh, relatively well uh, documented, uh, and we've seen. I don't need to repeat the figures because we've just we've just listened to how dramatic the situation is and how worrying it is. But now there's here an interesting point. We could be in a situation where only scientists would be worried about this, you know, insects. Why, why would the, the lay person worry about people usually don't like that much bugs and insects. But I would claim that insects have made their appearance, appearance in politics through exactly public opinion. Uh, this decline of insects comes together with other yeah, uh, major what? changes that people perceive as a problem and which indeed are as a fact a problem. Extreme weather events, plastic in the ocean, uh, mega fires, uh, forest fires uh, uh, in many places of the world. But I think this decline of insects gives to people a perception of an, uh, a risk, an encirclement, encirclement of pollution and unnaturalness that they don't like. So I seek in, indeed public opinion takes into account this fact to a certain extent and does politics move and indeed um, their appearance is here. But uh, if the evidence is very clear on this uh, decline, there are of course gaps in knowledge and we need more knowledge to fully understand what's happening in not only the world but what are the causes, how can we act. In any case, there's another element of science that is pretty clear which is there's uh, the need and even urgency to make our uh, food systems and our agricultural systems more future-proof, more sustainable. Um, if we don't do it, it will be to begin with the agriculture itself that will suffer from the soil degradation, water scarcity, and the loss of some services nature provides, one of which is pollination, which happens to be largely provided by insects. So I do think this key word pollination, pollinators, is part of the attention that the decline of insects receives because everyone understands it, from the farmer to the economist to the layperson to the scientist, of course. Um, another uh, important point is that um, uh, agriculture does depend on pollinators. At the same time, as we have seen, some forms of intensification of agriculture are also connected to the causes of decline. So uh, the knowledge that this atlas uh, brings in, uh, including in what amounts to how to do our food production more sustainable, is very useful and needed right at this time when we have not only this ambitious green deal, but also indeed these two strategies that came in May the EU Biodiversity Strategy 2002-2030 and the Farm to Fork Strategy. I would claim these strategies exactly address these three elements needed to bring insects back because they aim to recreate habitats. There's a, a huge EU nature restoration plan in the Biodiversity Strategy that includes putting back 10% of highly diverse landscape features the edges, ponds, trees, uh, flower strips that we've lost immensely in the last decades in Europe. It also aims to reduce the pressures, such as minus 50% of the use and risk of pesticides until 2030, and specifically minus 50% use of the most dangerous ones, or reducing by 50% the excess uh, fertilization and by 20% the use of fertilizers, all this will go in the direction of allowing more room for insects, insects to recover. And indeed also these, both the strategies do promote a transition towards agroecological and uh, practices and agroforestry. Organic farming is only one of the most known agroecological practices and indeed the proposal is to get to one quarter of EU agricultural land to be organic by 2030. Now, one key issue is farmers. Farmers are fundamental partners in this transition. Some fear this ambition of the strategies, but indeed, when we look to public uh, opinion polls on farmers themselves, there's a majority on the side of doing more for the environment or willing the common agriculture policy to deliver more for the, the environment. So we need to work with the farming community 
and helping in, in the transition. And indeed, what's the tool for that? Well, it's precisely the common agriculture policy that should help farmers in the transition towards a sustainable uh, agriculture. Here I would give one word, which is there's a new pro a proposal for a new common agriculture policy that the Commission has tabled. It does bring some uh, novelties like enhanced conditionality for the environment and climate, the eco schemes, the environmental and climate management uh, commitments that are in the proposal of the Commission. Some say it's not enough, some say it's too ambitious. There's one thing we, we now see clear. The proposal can match the ambition of the Green Deal, provided its ambition is maintained or even reinforced by the co-legislators. So I think this is a, a very important point so that we can indeed give more flexibility to member states to solve their agricultural problems, but keeping this uh, role of the Commission to ensure the green architecture as from the Green Deal and farm to fork and biodiversity can be fulfilled. Uh, I would also say that the Atlas uh, uh, points in the, the right direction in the sense of also addressing a more sustainable food, co food consumption. Uh, and actually the farm to fork strategy does aim to reduce food waste and also to stimulate dietary changes towards a more plant-based um, uh, approach that releases land for other purposes. Um, um, uh, a final point I will do is, even before the Green Deal indeed, even in the last commission, you, we, we, this commission, had already acknowledged and started to tackle the problem of insect decline, very noticeably by the first ever EU initiative on pollinators that was adopted in 2018, very close to, to public opinion and the support of citizens. We also cherish and follow up the citizen petition, Save Bees and Farmers, that's ongoing. So it's, again, a popular issue. Um, we think that addressing pollinators helps the wider nature. And of course, uh, the nature agenda in itself, more protective areas, more restoration, help pollinators. So there's a hand in hand this. this the initiative as a comprehensive scope of more than 30 actions addressing how, to, how to, to understand the problem, tackle the main drivers, engage actors. What I call your attention is that the new biodiversity strategy does boost the political ambition to reverse the decline of pollinators. It refers that the initiative will be reviewed by the end of this year and that on, the, on that basis, the Commission will consider follow-up actions in 2021. So I invite all stakeholders to keep following these initiatives on pollinators. I, I trust that this atlas and this webinar is a step in that direction already. And again, I apologize for abandoning immediately, but I leave you in the good hands of my colleague, Ria Dean, for the debate I will follow. So thank you very much, and I must run to another meeting right now. Thank you so much, Mr. Humberto Delgado Rosa, for having taken the time and for having provided us with some insights from the European Commission. So we really appreciated your keynote speech. Thank you for your time and good luck with the next webinar. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. And um, I think, uh, Vujadin, I will um, welcome you uh, once the panel starts, if that's fine. Uh, Vujadin Kovac. Uh, Kovacevic is a policy officer at the Biodiversity Unit at BG Environment in the European Commission and will um, continue to represent the views of the European Commission once we start the panel. We will now have a round of some political comments on the Insect Atlas and on what has been already said about the biodiversity um, farm to fork strategy and uh, common agriculture policy. And before we do so, I would like you guys to get active again on one more poll question. Um, this one uh, is more about your opinion rather than um, knowledge or, or, or sectors. Um, I would like to know, how do you think, oh, launch polling, sorry, I have to, have to click on that button. How do you think are the objectives of the biodiversity and farm to fork strategy reflected in the current uh, common agriculture policy reform proposal? Do you think they're insufficiently reflected, partly? well or don't you not don't you have enough knowledge to really answer that question
Okay, so I can see that um, very few think that it's really well um, reflected. Most of you think it's not sufficient. Some of you think one, one third, about one third thinks that they're at least partly reflected. And also one third doesn't really know. So um, with our political comments, yes, this is working. Okay, I will close the poll now. Um, with that in mind, um, and, and hoping to, to learn some more about your different, different views, I will now um, start that round of, of political comments. And we will start with a member of the European Parliament, namely Martin Häusling from the Greens, Eva. He is um, himself a farmer and was elected to the European Parliament in 2009. And there he is a member of the EU Agriculture Committee and also a member of the EU Environment Committee and is the Agricultural Policy Spokesman for the Greens. So um, Martin is going to speak in German. So please, for the non-German speakers, make sure that you clicked on the English button. Um, so Martin, how do you see the recently published strategies and the cap uh, in the light of the key messages that were outlined by, uh, by Christine Chemnitz and the Insect Atlas? Ja, erstmal ganz herzlichen Dank an die Böll Stiftung, dass dieses Webinar zustande gekommen ist und dass wir den Insektenatlas noch mal wirklich einer breiteren Öffentlichkeit darbringen können. Wir müssen über Insekten reden, obwohl wir im Moment in Deutschland ganz viel über Fleisch reden wieder. Also nächstes Mal muss die Böll Stiftung wieder ein Fleisch hat das machen, glaube ich. Aber ähm, jetzt haben wir ja eine, eine Vorlage der Kommission, die tatsächlich meiner Meinung nach sehr gut gelungen ist. Die Biodiversitätsstrategie und die Farm to Fork Strategie ist wirklich was, wenn man das liest und man sagen kann, ja, das sind, glaube ich, die richtigen Antworten. In vielen Bereichen sehr weitgehend, muss ich sagen. Also 30 Prozent der Fläche unter Schutz zu stellen, 10 Prozent der Agrarflächen sozusagen für Biodiversitätszwecke zu nutzen, klingt erstmal alles sehr gut. Ich sage das jetzt ganz bewusst, weil ich glaube, die Umfrage eben hat deutlich gezeigt, es gibt eine große Skepsis in der Umsetzung. Und wenn man mal zurückblickt, wir haben uns ja eigentlich in den Verträgen von Rio schon verpflichtet, den Verlust an Biodiversität im Jahr 2010 zu stoppen. Nicht jetzt eine Trendwende, sondern nur zu stoppen. Jetzt haben wir 2020, wir haben das nächste Ziel verfehlt und jetzt sagen wir 2030 wollen wir das erreichen. Das erinnert so ein bisschen an die Diskussion über die, über die Klimaziele. Ja, wir vertagen das immer weiter nach hinten und machen mit derselben Politik so weiter. Und das ist auch meine Kritik, das habe ich auch jetzt in der Aussprache mit Herrn Sinkiewicius, unserem Umweltkommissar, letzte Woche oder diese Woche im Umweltausschuss, im Agrarausschuss auch gesagt. Wo sollen denn die Ziele jetzt in der gemeinsamen Agrarpolitik verankert werden? Wir verhandeln zurzeit eine Agrarpolitik, die im Wesentlichen die Fortsetzung der bisherigen ist. Es soll in der zweiten Säule jetzt ein bisschen mehr Geld geben, das ist richtig aber nicht genügend. Und in der zweiten Säule der Agrarpolitik, da werden ja die, die langfristigen Umweltprogramme angesiedelt. Da ist jetzt nicht wesentlich mehr Geld. Und die erste Säule, das sind ja die Direktzahlungen für die Bauern. Da sollen 30 Prozent bei den Mitgliedstaaten genommen werden an Geld für, für freiwillige Umweltleistungen. Freiwillige. Das heißt, für das Land ist es verpflichtend, für das Mitgliedsland verpflichtend, 20 oder 30, da sind wir noch gar nicht einig, an Umweltleistungen in der ersten Säule auszuweisen. Für den Bauern ist es freiwillig. Und die Frage, wie soll denn das jetzt erreicht werden, diese anspruchsvollen Ziele, also 30 Prozent Ökolandbau, Förderung äh, bei der Umsetzung der, der größeren Zahl an Flächen für die Biodiversität, das muss ja irgendwie umgesetzt werden. Und das kann ich nur erreichen, wenn ich den Landwirten einen Anreiz gebe. Genau das, wir, was wir ja als Umweltverbände und als Grüne auch immer fordern, ist ja, öffentliches Geld für öffentliche Leistungen. Und ich muss einen Anreiz geben. Und dafür wird das Geld nicht ausreichen. Und für viele Bauern, die kommen jetzt in der Wirtschaft, die werden sagen, lohnt sich nicht, mache ich nicht. Und ich kann auch nicht im Gegensatz zu der Garde Rosa erkennen, dass viele Bauern von sich aus bereit sind, das zu machen. Ich glaube, es müssen zwei Ansätze sein. Zum einen müssen wir tatsächlich diese ganze Agrarpolitik umstellen, weg von einem System der der Flächenzahlung, die nur darauf beruht, dass ich Bauer bin und eine Fläche habe und dafür kriege ich Geld. Das ist nach wie vor im jetzigen Programm der Europäischen Union, im Vorschlag, sind das 60 Prozent der Gelder ohne nennenswerte Verpflichtung. Und das kann auf keinen Fall so bleiben. 
Und da müssen wir den Hebel ansetzen. Das andere ist aber auch, wenn ich 50 Prozent Pestizidreduzierung erreichen will, dann wird das auch nicht nur freiwillig gehen, sondern wir müssen unsere Zulassungskriterien für Pestizide ganz dringend ändern. Ich sage immer, unser Zulassungssystem ist ein einziges System von Irrungen und Wirrungen. Wir schauen immer, zehn Jahre ist ein Stoff auf dem Markt und dann fängt eine Diskussion an, ist er denn doch schädlicher, als er im Grunde genommen vorher eingeschätzt wurde. Letzte Diskussion um Neonicotinoide. Wir haben die ganze Diskussion um Glyphosat wieder vor uns. Und wir werden merken, irgendwann werden wir bei vielen Pestiziden merken, dass die langfristigen Folgen wesentlich drastischer sind, als wir alle äh, bei den Zulassungen äh, es im Auge hatten. Und deshalb, äh, egal ob das jetzt im Grunde ein ganz gefährliches Pestizid ist oder eins, was angeblich weniger gefährlich ist, wir müssen runter von den hohen Anwendungen. Und das geht dann auch nur gesetzlich. Also im Grunde ist mein Vorschlag immer, äh, die Bauern dürften nur noch auf Rezept eigentlich anwenden. Und nicht, wie Sie es für Ihre betriebswirtschaftlichen äh, Maßnahmen für sinnvoll halten, wenn Sie Pestizide anwenden. Das ist ja eine betriebswirtschaftliche Entscheidung. Und da muss man deutlich sagen, äh, das kann die Gesellschaft so nicht akzeptieren. Das Zweite ist, äh, und das hat auch ganz viel mit, mit der GAP-Reform zu tun, wir müssen wieder die Landwirtschaft vielfältiger machen. Das heißt, wir brauchen Fruchtfolgen. Die durchschnittliche Fruchtfolge in Deutschland sieht so aus, Mais, Weizen, Gerste. Wenn es gut ist, dann kommt noch Raps dazu. Das ist keine wirkliche Fruchtfolge. Wir brauchen wieder mehr Leguminosen. Und äh, gerade bei dem Punkt Leguminosen äh, müssen wir auch sehen, unsere Verantwortung für den Import von Soja ist enorm. Wir sind zweitgrößter Importeur. Wir importieren von 25 Millionen Hektar Soja in die Europäische Union. Und wir sind mitverantwortlich für den Verlust an, an primären Wäldern, vor allem in Südamerika. Das ist ganz klar und dieser Verantwortung müssen wir uns stellen. Und dann sage ich, gehört jetzt nicht ganz dazu, aber dann können wir mit solchen Ländern wie mit Brasilien nicht noch ein Freihandelsabkommen abschließen. Das ist eigentlich völlig kontraproduktiv, weil dieses Land wird nicht nachhaltig wirtschaften und da muss Europa ganz klar eine Reißleine ziehen. Ich sage auch noch was zum Stickstoff, weil der ist ja auch in dem, in dem, in dem Insektenland das angesprochen. Wir haben ein viel zu hohes Niveau an Düngung. Die Kommission sagt jetzt, wir müssen um 20 Prozent reduzieren. Das wird in vielen Bereichen nicht ausreichen, denn wir haben ja gerade da den meisten Verlust an Insekten, auch an, an Vögeln, die davon leben, in Regionen, die früher mal sehr extensiv waren. Also Magerwiesenflächen zum Beispiel. Und diese Flächen haben wir ja gar nicht mehr. Wir haben einen Stickstoffüberschuss auf jeden Hektar in der Europäischen Union von 50 Kilogramm. Das kann nicht so bleiben mal ganz abgesehen davon, dass sie eine enorme Gewässerbelastung haben. Und das sind alles Faktoren, wo wir jetzt wirklich rangehen müssen. Und äh, ein Satz noch, ich glaube einfach, äh, es wird nicht funktionieren, wie es die Kommission sich denkt, dass diese GAP-Reform dann auch in der Lage ist, äh, genau das alles zu erfüllen. Die Kommission hat jetzt gesagt bei der Aussprache, da sollen die Mitgliedsländer mal umsetzen, wie wir das wollen. Also ich habe viel Glauben und viel Hoffnung. Aber dass ausgerechnet die Mitgliedsländer, die noch einen schlechteren Entwurf haben, als der Agrarausschuss ihn vorgelegt hat, jetzt genau das umsetzen, was die Kommission will, das glaube ich wirklich als allerletztes. Also wir müssen noch von der Zivilgesellschaft muss viel mehr Druck gemacht werden. Wir müssen noch viel Parlamentarier überzeugen, dass wir in eine andere Richtung der Agrarpolitik einschlagen. Sonst wird diese farm to fork strategie und diese Biodiversitätsstrategie nicht zu den Ergebnissen führen, die wir ganz, ganz dringend brauchen. Vielen Dank. Thanks a lot, Martin, for these, um, for these comments. I think you touched upon um, many very important topics that will be um, raised again uh, during the panel discussion, like crop rotation, uh, the role of trade and soy imports, the role of fertilizer, um, nitrogen, and um, also the cap reform. And the cap reform also brings me to our next speaker, who is um, Guy Pierre. Um, <clears throat> He is um, from, from Academia, uh, brings in that, that view. Um, sorry. Um, he has worked extensively on understanding and addressing anthropogenic pressures on biodiversity, as well as agriculture and agriculture policy and its, in, uh, it, uh, its impacts on humans and nature. Um, and he is from the uh, German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research in Leipzig. So um, Guy, what, is your, uh, what, what does your research tell us 
um, about the relationship between agriculture and also agriculture policies on the EU level on insect decline um, and biodiversity in more general. So oh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, exposing me to the insect atlas and uh, demanding that I will look at the, into the details and comment on that. Um, so just to explain very briefly, I'm in origin a conservation biologist. I'm a butterfly uh, expert uh, and insect expert. Um, and actually these expertise of working on the declines of biodiversity have brought me to working on the CAP as the main uh, focus of my work. But in parallel to that, I'm also responsible for, uh, for instance, butterfly monitoring done by volunteers in Israel uh, for many years. Uh, so it's, it's both of these expertise that bring me to, to uh, this panel, hopefully. Um, with this, I could say, first of all, that um, from a scientific perspective, this is a very impressive document. It's very comprehensive. It covers uh, many different issues that are not covered in other topics, also indirect effect of agriculture and what can be done. It's visually very appealing, and I think this is very important. It uses examples that people can grasp, and this is valuable. Um, from my perspective as a scientist, it's also good to see that it's re reliable to complexity, not oversimplifying where it shouldn't do that. Um, sometimes it's oversimple, of course, because, for instance, we don't really know how many insects we really have. It could be that we have 5 million, uh, 10 million, or 30 million uh, species, I'm not speaking of numbers, but even just species. Um, <clears throat> but with all these uh, tiny things still, uh, it portrays a picture which was very clear to every insect expert already before the Holman paper came in 2017. What was really surprising for me as a scientist was the media response, the public response to understand the implications of losing insects on earth. It's not the survival of insects. It's not about the survival of, of bees and, and and butterflies and, and some ethical questions. It's our survival on earth because they provide us the pollination, the pest uh, control that we need. Um, and likely there is a lot of uncertainty uh, in what we know and what we don't know. Particularly, likely the services that are given by insects are a lot higher than estimated. For instance, some uh, estimated nowadays that uh, wild bees that are uh, hundreds, if not actually thousands of species of wild bees are providing a lot more pollination uh, than earlier thought. Um, and additionally, there's uncertainty because we are losing insects very rapidly in those areas of the world where we have least monitoring. Just to give a feeling of that, uh, just imagine that entomologists are using um, um, smoke in order to remove insects to collect them for, for recognition in forests. Now imagine this tiny amount of, of smoke used for collecting uh, uh, for collecting insects. And now imagine that the amount of smoke is enough from Indonesia to poison people in, in China. What does it do to, uh, to, to, to milligram insects in Indonesia itself? So the overall picture is very clear. And I think this is portrayed quite well by this, um, this document. It's also co correct that agriculture is a main driver uh, of these uh, problems. It's, it's in grasslands where uh, Martin Heusling was already talking about the intensification of grassland use, pasture use, a lot more cows uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the area that we have. We are producing more feed than actually food for ourselves. So we are utilizing huge amount of area and 65% of land use changes nowadays are attributable uh, to our meat and, and milk consumption. Actually, it's animal use, it's not only meat. Um, so we see intensification, we see expansion of uh, monocultures, uh, herbicides, we are forgetting that herbicides are also removing habitat, fertilizers were mentioned by Martin Heusling, um, the warming agents and, and antibiotics that we are using, for instance, are killing animals across the entire uh, uh, food chain up to humans. So the point is that we are fighting a, a few species and we are killing millions of them. And, and I think one of the nice examples is the pest mentioned in, in page 10 of the insect uh, uh, atlas with its with Papilio de Modeleus butterfly, which is considered a pest, although it eats merely the leaves of the citrus uh, 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 trees. It actually is not really a pest. So we are treating a lot more insects as pests than they really are. Okay, so with that, I come to the cup and what can be done in Europe about that. Um, we have evaluated the CAP already in 2014 
identifying that the exemptions and the low requirements set by the previous cap would lead to the failure of greening, which is indeed what we see in many documents. And we already evaluated the CAP proposal beyond 2020. And here I can only say that uh, the knowledge that exists was not taken up. The experience that exists in science on how we can do better was not taken up. And for this reason, 3,600 scientists have signed our petition or a call for the EU to take the knowledge that exists and to really implement it, uh, to take an action for the next CAP. The EU biodiversity have implications that are not yet possible to implement in the current CAP. And we do have a narrow but a critical time to improve the CAP uh, towards doing better. Now to explain, the CAP is not the driver of all these processes, but it's only an instrument which is failing to offer solution because most of the money is simply wasted uh, in giving farmers money without any requirements. Uh, and we have evaluated and found out that basically there's little impact of the CAP on farm management because people simply take the money and do whatever they want. Um, and this is not following the ideas of, of uh, public funds for public, um, for public goods, public, public payment for public goods. Um, and actually both farmers and the public uh, can and did ask for the CUP to do better. So with that, I think the, the critical issues to consider is that there's too much flexibility in the CUP, there's too much vagueness, which could be easily reduced. Just define what grasslands are and what quality grasslands are, and you'll be doing a lot better. Avoid empty measures or empty greening options, and this will apply for the new instrument called eco schemes. If the eco schemes will remain as vague as they are at the moment, they will not operate. And if the hope that eco schemes will save the world will remain, then we will lose the game because eco schemes are merely an instrument in pillar one, which is based on annual payments for farmers. So if you do an annual contract, how can you maintain fellow land for five years or even more? How can you maintain things that take time for, for uh, species to build themselves? How will you restore the landscape features that we lost in 2009 after abolishing the set aside? So what we really need here is, is clarity on what are 10% landscapes, how organic farming will be also biodiversity friendly because a lot of the organic farming production is not sustainable with all this plastic irrigation from south of Spain in biodiversity sensitive areas. We will fail the game if we don't define what are the implications of the EU biodiversity strategy for the CUP. And we need to do it now and not wait to implementation when the design is already bad. Um, <clears throat> now, indeed, it's not only the CUP. We will need to look into the farm to fork strategy we need to think about our impact in Brazil and other areas as consumers. We need to know our impact when we're uh, consuming so much milk and, and meat uh, products and to realize that the soy production in Brazil is for our consumption in the EU. That includes trading agreements, but it mostly requires courage from policymakers to address um, the food security uh, versus production and protection uh, narrative, which is just counterproductive. Both farmers and the public have the same interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. And don't hesitate to also share some of your um, research papers or interesting links in the chat so that our participants can, uh, can check them out. Um, and you said that um, yeah, a lot of scientific evidence has not really been taken up and that uh, scientists are waking up, that you have signed um, like a letter, you can also post that in the chat. And that also brings me to civil society, that is also waking up and becoming more and more concerned. And that's our um, last com comment from Veronika Feicht. She is a member of the circle of organizers of the European Citizens Initiatives Safe Bees and Farmers, which you might have heard about already. And she's an agricultural policy campaigner at the Umwelt um, Institute in Munich. Um, before I give the floor to you, I uh, tell you once, once again that you can ask all your questions in the questions and answers section because the panel is going to start right after the Veronica's comments. So if you um, have any um, things that are not, not clear or that you would like our panelists to develop further upon, uh, please ask your questions in the Q&A section. So Veronica, um, please tell us a little more about the European Citizens Initiatives. Um, what are the most important demands and how civil society is becoming more involved in general in, in the issue of, of insect protection? Okay, um, thank you, Lisa, for introducing me. And um, also thank you to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for um, publishing this insect answers. So for the alliance behind the European Citizens Initiative, Safe Bees and Farmers, 
The main takeaway from the Insect Atlas is that it reiterates once more the need for a radical system change when it comes to the way that we produce our food in Europe and in the world in general. It proves once more that the global insect collapse is indeed driven by industrial agrochemical based farming and that we are right on track tackling the heart of the problem with our initiative. So over the last decade, a significant number of citizens movements from across the EU have emerged to oppose pesticides and the model of intensive agriculture, which is destroying biodiversity and has our own livelihoods. There was this much debated local referendum organized in the South Tyrol village of Miles. There were 1.7 million citizens that showed up in town halls across Bavaria to save the bees. A success that has inspired many similar initiatives throughout Germany by now. There are the regular Marcia Stop Pesticidi protests in Italy. There are monthly actions by the We Want Poppies movement throughout France, just to give a couple of examples. And with this European Citizens Initiative, we are now bringing together all of these movements on the European level to show policymakers in Brussels and beyond that citizens do not support the current environmental, agricultural and pesticide policies. So what are our key demands? A complete phase out of synthetic pesticides by 2035 across the entire European Union. The restoration of biodiversity in agricultural areas and supporting farmers in the necessary transition towards agroecology. Over 140 civil society organizations from all over Europe, as well as hundreds of thousands of citizens, are asking the European Commission to take these measures because they do believe that they are necessary in order to halt the dramatic decline of bees, butterflies, and other insects which are vanishing from our landscapes at an alarming rate. So looking at the recently published Farm to Fork and Biodiversity strategies that were already mentioned quite a lot, we do indeed feel validated in our efforts to put pressure on policymakers with this initiative. To have the European Commission aim at a 50% reduction of the use and risk of pesticides within 10 years would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. So we are very happy to see that our voices are being heard. However, we do think this is not enough. 50% less poison is still poison. So what we really need to protect insects is not just half of the pesticides and a bit more organic farming, but a complete system change. If we do not want to end up in a future without bees and other pollinators, we need a complete phase out from synthetic pesticides. We do know from the reality we live in that as long as these toxic chemicals are on the market, these and other pollinators are suffering. The current admission system is clearly not working to protect nature as well as human health. And the only way to move forward is to remove 100% of synthetic pesticides from our environment. So we need 100% and we got 50%. This is not enough. But even this target is so far only a declaration of intent that is not legally binding whatsoever. So we think translating it into law will be crucial or it might actually mean nothing. Looking at the Commission's reform plans for various pesticide regulations, it looks like the responsibility for implementation is being shifted, of course, towards Member States. When at the same time, according to the Commission itself, it's apparently the member states that have until now failed in even adequately translating existing pesticide regulations into a reality that actually does protect biodiversity and human health. This is of course in no small part due to the massive lobbying efforts on national governments by the chemical industry, which will no doubt fight the 50% target with force too. So we are not convinced yet that even the 50% reduction will actually become a reality. All of this when what we really need is a change in cultivation practices and thereby a true system change. But far from this, the commission seems to be set on trying to achieve the reduction within the current system via technical measures, trainings and control methods that have been proven to be ineffective. Accordingly, the Civil Society Alliance behind the Safe Bees and Farmers ECI will continue their efforts to collect 1 million signatures across the European Union, 
and keep fighting for a 100% phase out of synthetic pesticides, as well as the restoration of biodiversity and a real system change in the way that we produce our food. Thank you very much, Veronica, for, for these insights. And um, also check out the chat. Um, so Guy has, has shared some interesting links and uh, we also posted the link to the European Citizens Initiatives uh, so that you can, you can join the movement if you would like to do so. Um, so we will now start the panel and to do so, um, I'm going to ask Wujadin to start his video so that he's on, on stage with us as well. Um, so as I said, he is um, replacing uh, Umberto Delgado uh, Rosa, who was um, giving this keynote speech that we still have the European Commission represented, and he is the policy officer at the Biodiversity Unit. Um, are you here? Can you hear us? Uh, hi, Lisa. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. We cannot see I'm you. Yes, I'm trying to start my video, but it does not seem to work. Okay. And your name is pronounced Vujadin, right? Or Vujadin? My name is Vujadin, yes. Let me... Vujadin. Yes, exactly. Now we can see you. Uh, ah, okay. Perfect. Okay. So, thank you. So thank you, you, you can, Yes, thank you. Uh, I had a bit of technical difficulty. So you see me through one app and you, you hear me from another app. But as okay, long as it's functioning, fine. fine. Uh, yes, I would just like to maybe complement a bit what Umberto said before and maybe, of course, to reflect on what has been also already addressed by the panel. But uh, first of all, let me thank again uh, well, Henry Ball Foundation and, of course, Friends of the Earth Europe uh, for making this atlas. We definitely need more knowledge uh, at this point in time on the insect decline and what we should be doing about it. And uh, of course, that kind of knowledge needs to be operational. Uh, we need knowledge that can uh, help us to uh, devise and implement concrete and effective actions on the ground. Now, I think it's quite clear to all of us that what we have, what we have in front of us is quite challenging. Uh, transforming, uh, transitioning the food production system, and not only food production, but also food consumption system is not an easy feature. And uh, of course, it's going to take a lot of efforts across the board. We are quite clear uh, that within the biodiversity strategy for 2030, we have something of a generational challenge to hold the loss. We know that previous attempts have failed. Uh, we have uh, learned lessons. And what we need to now is to, of course, remedy and uh, go into the different direction that will allow us to basically uh, let's we call it bending the curve first hold the decline and then of course reverse the decline restore uh, the biodiversity strategy for 2030 it's quite clear on that we do focus on pollinating insects but uh, uh, it's quite clear to us and we expect that uh, if we get this right that all insects and much wider biodiversity will benefit and therein the ambition of the commission is to reverse the decline uh, Usually the comments we are receiving now uh, on biodiversity strategy is, of course, what's going to be different this time around and how we're going to achieve uh, the ambition. And uh, if you go through the strategy, you can already see not only in terms of what kind of targets we set up, and it was already mentioned in previous comments, that uh, maybe uh, in the recent time it would not be maybe imaginable to have a pesticide reduction target uh, or providing more space for nature in the agricultural landscape, but we also have uh, an important element within the strategy, which is uh, legally binding restoration targets, uh, which will, of course, uh, we started to brainstorm already on those, and that this should be also uh, as soon as possible out. And this is, this is something that changes, uh, I think, the perspective as well. Now, in terms of the it's quite clear that pollinating insects and pollinators are basically let's call it a smaller issue, which mirrors much bigger, broader social challenges. And this is the way how we produce and consume uh, food. And uh, being uh, responsible for the development and implementation of the Eupolitus Initiative, 
it was quite clear from the beginning that we need to deal with these uh, broader challenges. So within the Ponto's initiative, we deal with, uh, with the way how we uh, produce food in the, lands in the farming landscape, uh, including pesticide use, including fertilizer use, uh, but also we deal you know, with the ways how to bring broader society into the picture. I think uh, under the Ponto's initiative, we were quite clear and uh, our efforts show that, that we need to bring all actors uh, across the societal board into the conservation action. So we involve citizens, we involve businesses, uh, besides all the usual stakeholders like uh, farming stakeholders, farmers, uh, land managers, and uh, of course, nature conservation NGOs. Uh, I would like to really stress, and this is quite important, and this is what the Eupolitics Initiative is uh, emphasizing, is that we have evidence that the situation is alarming in terms of decline of pollinating insects and uh, insects overall, but we need more of that operational knowledge. So we launched uh, fundamental exercises like a robust uh, systematic monitoring of uh, insect populations and trends. And we hope that these processes will, uh, of course, be implemented in the coming years, which will provide a concrete information where, how, uh, and who should be doing the things. And I think this, this is critical, really getting that uh, operational information and knowledge that we can really know where we started, what did we do, and what else needs to be done if uh, the decline has not been reversed. Thank you very much for that intervention. So you talked about the biodiversity strategy and, um, and how the biodiversity strategy for 2020 basically failed. And I would like to further explore why that was so and how it could be different this time. So in a report um, released earlier this, this, uh, this month, the European Court of Auditors basically slammed the common agricultural policies performance on biodiversity, which is why I would like to talk about the cap again. Um, so maybe, maybe Martin, you can say something about um, how you, do you see the chances of CAP reform being updated after the publication of the biodiversity um, and farm to fork strategy? Will member states um, raise their ambitions? And also, um, how do you see the role of Germany um, with the upcoming uh, council presidency in only a few days from now? Yeah, the commission says, okay, Precision farming is the answer for we have with pesticides. And I think it's not the right answer because uh, if you see who is uh, the biggest company who says precision farming is the answer, it's Bayer. It's Bayer, Monsanto, and John Deere. Uh, these big companies say precision farming is the answer. And I don't think Bayer want to have uh, an answer to, to, to lower the, in the, the use of pesticides. So this is one of the problems. No, we need a strong regulation on pesticides. We need uh, a better regulation uh, for pesticides. This is the answer. And if the commission don't want this, they never get uh, less than 50% of the use of pesticides. I don't think so. And um, we see the problems in Germany with, uh, with the water regulation. Uh, farmers have to now to to lower their in uh, their the, uh, so to, to lower the use of uh, fertilizers, 20% less than at the moment. It is, uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem for to implement this in the, in the German government, in the Bundesländer. And uh, I don't see if now they have to lower 20% more, how we get this in the field. Thank you, Martin. And I hope that next time that you would like to say something, you can do so in German again. Um, Christine, would you like to, to compliment uh, the, these comments on the CAP reform? Yeah, just very briefly, actually, because I, I have the feeling, you know, what, even though I, I like these comments on we need more knowledge, is that it is so important that we know enough to act. So we have to act now. And actually, um, one of the major problems within the whole agriculture sector is always to miss the lack of political will. And this is something actually what we face since, I have the feeling since decades, that at the moment, for example, the German ministry again 
has, you know, we have so severe problems, for example, in our meat sector, especially showing up now with COVID-19. There have been scientific results on what to do, what are the necessary reforms, what should be done. So everything is on the table, political will is lacking. And this is what I see for as well for, for the protection of insects, actually, because it's not, you know, minor steps will not help in changing the situation. We need pretty drastic steps. We need like ambitious steps. And this is something where, you know, it's not, a, it's not enough to, to just, as has been said before by Veronica as well, that we reduce pesticide use a bit, but continue with everything else the same way we did before. But we really need to change our the way we produce and consume. And so we need ambitious member states governments. And the question is, what do we need to get them there? And I think actually public pressure is one. And 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 so I think um, the European Citizens Initiative is so important, you know, and and we definitely need more pressure as well in Germany to make the, Euro, uh, the German EU presidency at all uh, a viable moment in time. But um, I'm pretty skeptical about it again, because our agriculture minister actually is on the forefront of blocking most things. Yes, thank you, Tina, for these, um, for, for complimenting the Mar Martin's comments. So you talked about, um, more radical steps that are needed to really um, take the objective set out in the strategy more seriously this time. And you also talked about creating public pressure. So I would like to address the next question to, to Veronica Weich from the ECI. Um, so my first question would be, um, what needs to happen for your proposal of an 80% reduction by 2030 to become reality? And we also have a question in the Q&A section um, related to that. I don't know if you, if you saw that. Um, yeah, how, how, you, how do you think this can be, um, yeah, become reality in only 10 years from now? Yeah, so um, our overall goal, of course, um, as I said, is um, to have a hundred percent, you have to be a hundred percent pesticide free by 2035, but we do plan to reach this goal via a gradual phase out, including a first step of an 80% reduction by 2030 which is of course 30% more than what the commission is proposing. And to get there, we propose that within two years, um, the pesticides that are part of the candidate for a step, um, substitution list shall be phased out as they are among the most toxic active substances on the market. And within five years, um, we propose insecticides and herbicides shall be phased out while fungicides um, should be gradually phased out within 10 to 15 years, leaving time for agricultural sectors that are highly susceptible to fungi to develop innovative practices. Obviously, to achieve this, um, the necessary economic framework conditions must be created, which is why we are proposing that the cap money be put to good use towards the necessary transition towards agroecology. And above all, this means, of course, that alternatives to synthetic pesticides must take precedence politically, an objective that is clearly lacking from the current plans by the Commission. For us, this means favoring farmers that use sustainable, poison-free farming methods. It also means investing in research on agroecological methods to public resources, which were so far allocated to the research of agrochemicals. Of course, we realize that simply removing pesticides from the current system of intensive agriculture and just waiting to see what happens is not the way. What we need is to move away from input intensive monocultures towards a variety of knowledge intensive cultivation practices, such as crop rotation based on smallholder agriculture and of course adapted to local and regional parameters. And just to get back to the question in the Q&A, um, I, I already um, provided an answer, um, a written answer in the chat, but I just want to reiterate that um, there is no evidence to support the, the claim that we need synthetic pesticides to feed the world. In our opinion, this is a myth created by the 
chemical industry. And if you look at the science, for example, this um, report that I, did, that I quoted in the chat by the um, International Assessment of Agriculture, Knowledge, Science and Technology for Development, they actually do recommend kind of the opposite, which is including um, improving agroecological and low input farming methods. And you can look at this um, in this um, PDF, which I can send a link to later, but you will not find anything that tells us we do need synthetic pesticides to feed the world. So yeah, that, that's something that I just want to like emphasize. This is a claim that we don't actually have evidence for, and I would advise against believing these myths created by the industry. Thank you. And I would also um, like to tell all our attendees, so if you click on the questions and answers section, you can also click on answered and there you will find the written answer that Veronica has provided for the, for the question. Um, another question that was asked in the Q&A section is how, by um, Susanne Astik, how to address the contamination and collapse of fish due to the excess use of pesticides and also their dependency on insects. How are they, how are they interconnected and what measures um, are in the EU strategies um, already? Maybe the European Commission, um, um, Vujadin Kovacilic can, can say something about that and how can we best deal with that? So I will um, give the floor to Guy who um, would like to answer that question live and who has expert knowledge on, on these interlinkages. Okay, I don't know if you see me well. I think something happened now technically. Um, no, you're fine. So indeed, uh, in the last years, we've been increasingly exposed to impacts of the cap and of agriculture on, on water. There have been some improvements actually in inland uh, water management, especially because of, of coherence of the cap uh, with the cross, uh, due to cross compliance with the water framework directives. But we do see major impacts outside uh, and into the Baltic Sea, um, North Sea, etc. So the point is actually that the same measures that we need for, for insect declines and the use of, of agrochemicals uh, will also address um, um, the, the water uh, problems. So I think in this sense, this is, this is going hand in hand in the same way also that we know what needs to be done um, with respect to climate and, and reduction of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, the problem of what you call surface pollution, which is basically to say agriculture uh, has been a, a problem for many years and actually the same solutions or the same set of solutions um, exist already for many years. The problem is uh, that they're not implemented and partly because of, of science-free decisions uh, in the coming uh, cup, the biggest uh, mistake, which is from a scientific perspective, simply a no-go is the decision to cut on pillar one instead of pillar two of the cup. The instruments to improve the cup performance are not in pillar one. They are basically in rural development and they are also tools to improve uh, rural development uh, problems, etc. So I think in this sense, uh, addressing both in the same basket and expanding on, on pillar two will be um, probably the best solution. Um, there's one more question that you might um, want to refer to at the very bottom, whether there are any um, economic and political analyses of the direct and indirect impacts of different necessary steps that we touched upon, like reduction of pesticides, more broadly reduction of unsustainable consumption, especially meat and dairy products, etc. because that would feed into the political dialogue. So that was um, Pierre Paolo Piras from EU DEFCO. It's, it's actually a very good question, uh, partly because of, of two uh, main issues. First of all, the biggest criticism on the cup misperformance mis comes from economists, not from ecologists, and it comes from many years. It comes also from the World Trade Organization for basically distortion of markets, for, for uh, competitiveness-oriented behavior, which is counterproductive. This was the reason for the cup to shift away from what you called coupled payments to area-based payments, but this is a new, uh, with new diseases. So the economic perspectives are known and fully ignored. If the cap would be uh, uh, an effective and if efficient instrument, everybody would be happier. And that's actually, it, there is no need for an impact assessment of, um, of the implications of the EU biodiversity. And the second interesting issue is that when, when there were calls to perform an uh, impact assessment, or if you want a fitness check of the cup, 
uh, the previous commission refused it. And I guess because they knew that the evidence is simply against the cup as it stands. I mean, we performed a uh, fitness check of the cup independently and our findings were staggering and strong. The cup is simply an inefficient and irrelevant instrument. Um, simply because of, of lobby pressures sitting on maintaining an interim solution called direct payments. Um, but actually direct payments don't even have an objective and they fail on their own objective of, of income support and employment. So in this sense, uh, even the bigger and stronger evidence on what needs to be improved in the cup comes from the economic perspectives. Um, I don't think we need an impact assessment, but if so, science is there and there are many dis disciplines in science. Uh, so we need to remember that knowledge comes not only from ecologists, but also from economists, social scientists, uh, political scientists who have studied how the cup behave and why it fails on its uh, reforms as well. Um, and with this, maybe I would, I would add that that's actually the, the moment we are in in history, which is really impressive. We have a new commission. We have uh, a new Green Deal a farm to fork strategy. We have uh, three people in the commission, which seems to have a lot of ambition. Um, and I think this ambition is necessary because a cap for sustainability from an economic, from a social and environmental perspective would regain public trust, trust not only in the cap, but in the EU as a project. Cap is 40% of the EU budget. And if the cap continues to fail, then the EU has a major problem. And in seven years from now, we cannot uh, take the risk of saying again that we failed. And it's not only failure for insects, it's failure for farmers. Um, farm employment is, is declining together with the increase in farm sizes. And we cannot continue these processes. Where I see the biggest uh, challenges is basically with the parliament. We see a bigger parliament now in terms of green aspects. But when I listened to the discussion earlier this week uh, with the commission, uh, the committee for agriculture, I did not see much improvement, unfortunately. And so Maybe my recommendation- Maybe now that's where Martin Häusling can step in again. He has already- so, so I would to like to ask Martin Häusling what he thinks about Article 55 of the rules of the Parliament regarding co-decision between ComAgri and ComEnvy, because if ComAgri continues the way it does, I don't see hope in the Parliament. Um, <clears throat> That's a big topic. We, can, we, will, we won't have the time to address that question in, in, in detail, but maybe Martin, briefly some, some comments yes, on yes. that. Yes, you, you listen to the Aki Committee. Yes, uh, the Aki Committee, there is no big change. The, the old committee they fight for farmers and they fight for money for farmers and they have no interest for the biodiversity strategy. And, uh, but you see the Envy Committee, it's more progressive in the Envy Committee and we hope at the end, the whole parliament has to say uh, yes or no to the common agriculture policy. In October, maybe uh, we have the vote in, in, the, in the parliament and all the members, have to vote on the common agriculture policy. So we may have to make pressure on all the members and not only on the pressure on to make on the members in the ACRI committee. But so now I have to leave because I have the next conference in three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, for me as an organic farmer, organic agriculture is one of the answers to change a lot of things. Okay, bye. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, vielen, vielen, vielen Dank, dass du äh, mit dabei warst und viel Erfolg für deine, äh, für deine nächsten Web-Conferences noch und wir bleiben in Verbindung. Vielen Dank. Ja. Yes, time is indeed running. So um, maybe as a, as a last intervention from our panelists, um, I'd like to ask um, Vujadin Kovacevic to, to comment again on, um, on the interlinkages between biodiversity, farm to fork, and, and cap reform as well. How does the, the commission um, see that and how do the DGs work together across, across DGs? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's quite clear that uh, there is the ambition uh, within the European Green Deal and that comes from the commission and it was of course uh, the role of the public was critical to shape uh, that ambition. Now we need to translate that ambition into concrete actions on the ground and of course, it was rightfully pointed too that this is not only about the commission. Uh, it's also about the co-legislator, it's about the parliament and the council. Uh, they will be instrumental to uh, setting that level of the translation of the ambition into the actions. Uh, of course, the role of the public, role of the stakeholders will continue to be uh, critical as well in all these processes. I saw some questions in the chat that basically ask 
how the public can continue to be involved. Of course, the, the farm to fork, biodiversity strategy, the CAP, these are extremely comprehensive frameworks. And there will be a lot of actions within those, and within those actions, there will be a lot of opportunities for public consultation. And of course, for expert consultation, and it's critical that the public and the stakeholders uh, actively participate and uh, uh, basically stake their interest in the debate. Uh, just to mention once, because uh, you, Lisa, uh, also ask about why the previous policies have failed. Uh, it's quite clear if you see what is in the new strategy, why they failed. Now in the new strat biodiversity strategy, we have clear, precise, measurable, measurable commitments in the, uh, which is uh, comparison to the previous strategies. So basically, we want to have smart targets. We want to be able to measure the progress and not only measure the progress after five or 10 years, but have kind of a dynamic measurement that we can correct the direction if it's not the right in the, in the shorter time period. Of course, we are also looking to strengthen the governance framework. This is critical. We, we need to have a more robust framework where it's gonna be clear what needs to be done and who is gonna uh, do it. Uh, there was also a question on the funds uh, for the restoration and of course uh, the common agriculture policy in the agriculture context will continue to be one of the major powerhouses in funding restoration activities under the environmental uh, pillar but also there are other funds I mean uh, I don't know if uh, the participants are aware but there is a big uh, European uh, Green Deal call under Horizon 2020 and under there under Area 7 there is a dedicated uh, uh, work stream on ecosystem restoration. And of course, life, as it was also already pointed in the chat box, will continue to be that catalyzer. Uh, life cannot fund all restoration activities, but it can catalyze activities that can be uh, later on scaled up by different EU funds. Uh, quick question or quick answer also on the freshwater system, marine uh, ecosystems. This is crucial. We should not forget those. I mean, this is crucial. What we actually expect is that if we uh, take care of the food production, uh, in terrestrial ecosystems, this, this will of course have ripple effects on other ecosystems. There will be less effluence going into our rivers and into our seas, and of course polluting less. So it's critical to address the problem at the source. And this is where, for example, Polynesia's initiative can definitely uh, help. And again, I repeat, we have uh, a provision for uh, legally binding ecosystem restoration targets, which we look to strengthen the existing legislative framework. So we have the Birds and uh, Habitats Directive, and of course we have Marine uh, and Water Framework Directives. And those kind of targets will bind everything together in a more coherent uh, framework. So I would say the main difference is that we want to measure, have clear targets that can be measured and that can be accessed, assessed not only in the long term, but also in the, in the short term. Thank you, um, Vujadin. So um, with uh, regards to the time, I now unfortunately have to wrap up the discussion, even though we still have a lot of things that we would like to talk about. Um, but I think it has become clear that um, until very recently we have not paid enough attention um, to protecting insects despite their high value for both ecosystems and our entire economies. And farmers do not get paid for, for doing so either. But this is exactly what should, should actually happen. We talked about how the European Union still spends about 40% of its budget on agriculture, so there is money, um, but it should be spent in a more targeted manner to make climate and insect friendly um, models of farming more um, uh, yeah, attractive to farmers. Um, delivering on the environmental um, ambition of the farm to fork and biodiversity strategy will be impossible without a structural ref um, reform of the cap. That's also what we, what we talked about. Um, it do, they both strategies um, feature comprehensive targets, but much will depend on concrete policies, their implementation, and also funding, as Gaia mentioned as well. So a crucial step to better protect them as of now is a more stringent um, regulation of pesticide use, as we heard from, from Veronica in, in her um, citizen, European Citizen Initiative. And it's also, we haven't really talked about that, but I would like to stress that, um, not very coherent to keep exporting highly toxic uh, substances to third countries while they're still, for, while they're already forbidden here in Europe. That's another thing that, that should be tackled. Um, meat consumption also remains a blind spot. Um, the, the 
keynote speaker briefly mentioned attempts to to tackle that but um, really seriously um, there are no uh, concrete measures in in the proposal um, to to re to really incentivize a more plant-based diet um, and we also um, briefly touched upon but can uh, talk about that much longer on uh, the need to um, also look outside the fields right at our front doors um, Martin Häusling mentioned trade and the import of soy and the role that plays um, when it comes to insect decline worldwide. So we really need ambitious policies, not only in the European Union, but also globally. And um, the, 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 no, the bargaining power of the EU should here not be underestimated as the EU is indeed the world's largest trading bloc. Um, so I invite you all to, to download our Insect Atlas 2020. You will find the link in the chat. Um, and you can also Google it. You will find um, over 80 infographics uh, on, on, on 60 pages. Um, and they also talk about much more than we were able to do today. It also talks about trade with living insects. Um, insects then can be eaten as a, as, as a source of protein. It talks about um, genetic engineering, um, pollination by um, drones, etc. So it's really a very interesting insect, uh, atlas that I recommend you to, to read and spread the word. You can even order um, printed versions um, as of July if you would like to do so. Um, and also don't forget the European Citizens Initiatives. Um, you will also find a link in the chat if you would like to inform yourself more on that. So on that note, I would uh, like to warmly thank you um, to all our, our panelists. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having taken the time to prepare that. 